of uh, Forrest Way Shrunk, who's been very much into pushing us to look at movies more seriously and show movies during the conference. And for the first time, we had sessions on movies at this conference. And I just like to movie screenings, and um, we've got um, a number of scholarly movies as well as gaspers, whatever they are. <laughs> and um, they'll be shown um, in the Golden Hall Room in the afternoons at 2 p.m. And in addition to these feature movies, we have shorts that are throughout all the presentations. So this is a new thing that we're getting into. Okay, so um, some of you are a bit worried about the title of this session. Um, what did it mean? Uh, you see it's Oh Yay, Oh Yay, Oh Yay. Sound Studies and Science and Technology Studies. I was thinking of the bell ring announcing sound has arrived at 4X. And this has been kind of my pers personal mission over the years. And I realized, looking back at my CD, that I organized a session at the Bielefeld Conference back in 1996. It's actually two sessions called SGS Faces the Music. At that time, I was studying the Moog synthesizer. I just started my studies of it. And I was trying to get STS interested in, in those days, music. And now I see it more broadly in terms of sound studies, which has really taken on as a field. Um, now, when you, as president of this organization, you get to influence the direction of scholarship just by choosing one presidential theme, and this is my one, and people start to whisper in your ear, you know, wouldn't it be good to have a session on this? Some scholar said to me, it's a real scandal. We haven't had any on the third wave of the presidential plenary yet. So people are trying to influence me. And there's lots of sessions on the third wave of science studies at, at Forest. So this is not such a session. But I thought it was time to actually have SAM as a formal session. And so to do this, I invited the, one of the leading scholars of SAM studies, Jonathan Stern, who's going to talk for about 30 to 40 minutes. And we've got two responses from two other leading scholars in sound studies. So I'll introduce Jonathan first in a formal way, and I'll introduce our two other speakers as they come to the microphone after Jonathan. They'll speak short, for a shorter period of time, 15 minutes each, and we'll throw it over open to general Q&A. Um, I've known Jonathan quite some time now. He's a professor of art history and communication studies at McGill University. He got his PhD in communication at the University of Illinois. And Jonathan kind of burst upon the sound scene with an amazing book called The Audible Past, Cultural Origins of Sound Reproduction, which was published by Duke University Press in 2003. Um, and as this field of sound studies has developed, Jonathan, has, I think, has become the leading scholar. He's, he, every area of sound studies people write about, you usually find something by Jonathan Stone. He's written great articles about, say, the, the experience of sound in shopping malls. A whole range of interesting topics. Um, his latest book with Duke University Press in 2012 is called MP3, The Meaning of the Format. And he's, he'll be talking today about some of the ideas in that book. He's also edited The Sound Studies Reader with Routledge in 2012. So um, the title of his talk today is MP3, Listening Practices and the Construction of Media Technologies. I hope that's the right title. You changed it. Okay. So anyway, I'll hand over to you. Please welcome Jonathan Stern. Wow. Well, uh, thank you all. Uh, thanks, Trevor, for that great introduction. Thanks, Wes and Tyrone, for some uh, help with audio technology. And really, thanks to all of you for coming. This is uh, super exciting to be, uh, to be here. It's... Uh, um, a real pleasure, it's an honor, um, and also a special delight to have uh, responses from two of my uh, favorite scholars um, afterwards. Uh, I'm going to apologize to you now for the layout of the room. I made it myself. It didn't come out quite right. Uh, I am um, also I have paralyzed vocal cords, so I sit to deliver these things, because otherwise I will eventually pass out from talking, because I won't, my brain won't let my mouth stop talking. So. Uh, I'm going to give you some of the arguments for my book, MP3, The Meaning of a Format. Um, of course, it is hard to give an overview of a 125,000 word argument uh, in 30 minutes. So I'm going to focus on some big claims, a few details, 
um, give us some things to talk about, and then we can uh, we can get into uh, more discussions afterwards. If you don't have the book and you're curious about the book after listening to me, um, you can Google MP3 Jonathan Stern Scribe and uh, read the and abstractions that turn sound into signal. Thanks. We're almost out of time, but I think we'd like to have a bit of discussion, maybe time for a couple of questions, so um, it's your chance to make some sound. <laughs> yeah, over there. Oh, Jen? Yeah. If we don't have a mic, just broadcast show online for free, um, and that's a picture of the cover of the book, and it's also, hopefully, in your university library, or you can buy it from the new table outside. Okay. So what is an MP3? Well, since we're at 4S, if I were to tell you it's a socio-technical assemblage, would you be surprised? <laughs> uh, MP3 is a file format. It is a file format for sound on your computer, just like doc is a format for uh, word processor documents, PDF is a format for images and text. It is also a standard. Um, and as a standard, it's something that is you know, a piece of intellectual property that's owned by somebody. It is a protocol by which technologies, industrial systems, um, institutions, um, and media practice, practices interoperate. It is a protocol through which sound can circulate across different technical, cultural, social, um, and sonic strata. And finally, I'm not going to say much about this today, but one of the things that's interesting about the MP3 it is most rigidly a protocol for decoding sound, um, digital sound. I'm actually going to talk about the encoding side of it today, uh, but it's most rigid in its decoding uh, protocols, which means that it is future compatible. Now, MP3s, I'll say one other thing, which is MP3 stands for Layer 3 of the MPEG-1 standard, which was published in 1993. MPEG-1 is short for Moving Picture Experts Group, uh, which, they, which they later added associated audio. MPEG came together in 1988 to develop a standard for satellite video and video compact discs. And for six months, the engineers actually forgot that these things had to have sound. So the original video compact disc did not have a soundtrack, and so they added uh, moving picture experts group and associated audio later that year. So um, there's two other layers. So layer three is MP3. Um, and now MP3 is actually a branding, like they actually had a branding exercise and named it that. It's not just a short. Uh, abbreviation. Uh, layer 1 nobody uses, and Layer 2 is actually um, the audio used with MPEG video. So you'll hear Layer 2 audio on the internet, um, on certain DVDs, on video compact discs, and over satellite radio or television. Um, so this standard is everywhere. And as I've, um, uh, as this, I mean, this, these numbers are from 2011, so it's not really right now anymore, except in that authorial, as I write this sentence. Um, it is the most common form of recorded or transmitted audio in the world. Now, it isn't just more common than um, all other forms of audio. You could say that there are more MP3s in circulation right now at this moment than all other forms of audio recording or transmission in the history of the world combined. So we're talking about a massive scalar change in the sort of techno-cultural modes through which recorded, transmitted, transduced sound circulates. So the website for Thompson, who serves as a licensing representative for Fraunhofer, one of the companies that owns most of the intellectual property in the MP3, they list per unit royalty rates for PC hardware, computers like this, software, integrated circuits, digital signal processors, 
Um, it was per title reach for video games and a straight percentage of broadcasting related revenue. I'm going to start my clock. Um, the list of licensees reads like a who's who of new media distribution. So you see the companies that you can expect. Amazon pays in. Apple pays in. Microsoft pays in. Motorola pays in. But you also see other kinds of names. Airbus, CNN, Focus on the Family, Mattel. So MP3 is a creature of the new media environment, but it also has its technical niches in air travel, news, toys, and evangelical Christianity. For each commercial niche, it has, um, with over $100,000 in revenue per year, a fee must be paid. So we're talking about a massive economic, cultural, technical phenomenon. Um, and the field that I, I don't know what field I come out of anymore, uh, but one of the fields I come out of is media studies. And it would be easy to think of the MP3 as a kind of media phenomenon, except that the old definition of media that we use isn't very satisfying anymore. So I have a sort of very stereotypical image to go with the media word on the overhead there. And think about it for a moment. When we talk about television, radio, cinema, um, print, all, sound recording, there is usually an assumption of a set of sort of scaled relations between consumer electronics, technical infrastructures, institutions, cultural practices, right? So this image of a television is metonymic for, or actually it's synecdochic for, whole sets of regulatory apparatus, technical practices, family practices, um, forms of cultural memory, techniques of representation, and on and on. But today, MP3s don't really conform to the story. So the first thing is, um, you, can't really, you can hold MP3s in your hand, but it's usually a lot on a time on a device. So they're not immediately sensible to the end user in the same way as objects that something like a television would be. The second thing is that today, the register of technological change in communication has changed. So whereas before media history was written in terms of these big, stable things called media, today there's all this other stuff that we have to account for. We cannot assume ahead of time the scale of technocultural change when we're talking about change in communication and media. So, rather than saying we can assume a set, a certain scale or a set of relations, now, all of a sudden, we're asking questions about any time you're looking at any change in the new media world. You're talking about a mess of standards, platforms, infrastructures, protocols, consumer electronics, hardware, software, middleware, users, scripts, texts, operational routines, narrative or ludic scenarios, and of course, formats. So scale itself becomes a variable. To study media, especially to study media as technical phenomena, today means the first question you have to ask is what scale should I be thinking of? Are we talking about the infrahuman? Are we talking about massive infrastructural phenomena? Or are we talking at the scale of consumer electronics? So, MP3 is a format, a special kind of format. And the first question we have to ask is, well, why are MP3s so successful? And I'll give you sort of the simple technical answer now, and then I'll make it much more complicated. The simple technical answer is MP3s are so much so successful compared with the other digital formats uh, because they're small. Your average MP3 is 12% the size of the same file on a CD. So if you have a song on a compact disc, I know nobody does anymore, but this was the point of reference when they were designing uh, the format in the 1980s. Uh, if you take a song, 
full bandwidth song on a compact disc, you run it through an MP3 encoder, you get something that's about 12% the size, although you can, you can choose that. And at the bottom, what you have is a signal flow diagram from uh, the Fraunhofer Institute, who are the people I mentioned before. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about one corner of that diagram in a minute. So how do you make, how do you make it sound smaller? Well, first you transduce it into something else. And then, once it's that something else, you can manipulate it. Since MP3s are digital, we'll talk about two different kinds of coding. The first is Huffman coding. Uh, David Huffman was a student of uh, Robert Fano, who is a collaborator of Claude Shannon, who I assume many of you have heard of uh, because he's such an important figure in the history of uh, information theory, cybernetics, and many things that um, SDS people write about. Uh, Huffman coding is basically number trees, so uh, um, digits that happen more frequently become easier for the computer to access. It is essentially um, a way of making things easier for the computer to manage. And I should say, whenever I give a technical explanation in this talk, please assume that the sentence begins with, it is a tremendous simplification to say that. Okay. So that's Huffman coding. Now, if you run your compact disc through a Huffman coder or your, um, uh, your uh, full bandwidth audio file that you, you downloaded from a, a site that sells those, what you get is something about half the size of the file on the compact disc. Now, that's all well and good. Um, and in fact, today, people that use lossless coders like FLAC or Apple lossless will um, uh, wind up with files of about that size. But this wasn't good enough in the 1980s, really in the 1970s when they started thinking about uh, doing this. And the reason was very simple. They had particular goals. The engineers who were designing this stuff had particular goals that they wanted to meet. Um, they wanted to be able to transmit digital audio in real time over digital lines. And digital lines had very limited bandwidth in the 1980s. Hard drives were small compared to uh, what they were now. So they needed a way to make files smaller. And this is where perceptual coding comes in. Perceptual coding is the idea that the human ear, paren, I know very well that there's no such thing as a human ear, uh, but the human ear does not hear all of the sound that's bouncing in a room or all of the sound that is reproduced on a uh, compact disc. And therefore, if you really want to save space, what you do is figure out what's not going to be heard anyway, take it out, and then transmit the signal. Now, it turns out this is a very old idea, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, but uh, this technique is called perceptual coding. And most people, in most cases, cannot tell the difference between perceptually coded audio and the original audio file. It says most people, in most cases, not all people in all cases. So in this, in this signal flow diagram, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that there's this perceptual model. And so the very first thing that happens when an MP3 is made from full bandwidth digital audio is the audio is fed into filters that transform it, but it's fed into this perceptual model. And you see the, the line is blacker going into the perceptual model than coming out. And that's because the perceptual model actually controls the filters. It tells them what to do. So the MP3 encoder chops the signal into thousands of little bits every second and tries to figure out what parts of the sound you're not going to hear. So already, we, what we have here is a very particular relationship between infrastructure and content. We have an infrastructure that doesn't quite work to transmit the content we want, so we have to change the content. That's basically how the engineers are thinking in the 1980s. Now, this perceptual model comes out of a field called psychoacoustics. Psychoacoustics is the study of human auditory perception. And uh, psychoacousticians are not so interested in what, in the meaning of what people hear, but rather um, the mechanism of hearing. What I have up here is a table of what are called critical bandwidths. And uh, you can imagine a critical bandwidth as a kind of lane 
Um, so here we have 25. Imagine there are 25 lanes um, in your ear for different frequencies. And as long as we're using the lane metaphor, we use a trunk metaphor, appropriate for today in the uh, conference that's going on next door, right? If there is a giant 18 wheeler in the lane and you're driving a Volkswagen, your Volkswagen will not fit into the lane at the same time. This is basically how masking works and how the theory of critical bands work, which is um, once a sound fills up a critical bandwidth, another sound will be masked, will be hidden from the ear. So I can actually uh, demonstrate this to you sonically. I'm going to play you two pairs of recordings. In the first, um, all the energy is concentrated in a single bandwidth. In the second, the energy is spread across multiple bandwidths. First you'll hear tones, then you'll hear noise. And the effect is the second recording sounds subjectively louder than the first. So here we go. So that's basically the model on which the MP3 works. You have um, all this sound that is being pushed in to various critical bands that doesn't actually need to be there. It pulls it back up. Now, there's some other things happening that made the MP3 coder work. But for our purposes, this perceptual model is the thing uh, that we're going to talk about. And it's history. Now, the reason I'm interested in this, like normally when people talk about MP3s, if you read the journalism on them, there are two concerns. One is file sharing in the future of the music industry. I'm concerned about that, and it's something worth talking about. And the other is sound quality. Oh, sound quality of audio has really decreased, and this is a problem. I'm interested in something else. There's a human subject inside that, an idealized human subject inside that perceptual model, right? This is right within, shall we say, the wheelhouse of science and technology studies, right? There's a script. There's an idealized user right in the code. Inside every MP3 is a shadow of the gaps and absences of human hearing as idealized by psychoacoustics. So how does a history of ideas get built into a technology? If we treat a format as a cultural uh, artifact, what does it say about hearing? What are the layers of culture, industry, and politics built into this very mundane thing? Now, before we go further, I want to point out that in practice, the difference between an MP3 and a CD quality recording is very subtle. And so I want to give you a, uh, a uh, couple different recordings so you can hear how we're really talking about very subtle sonic differences versus very large data size differences. So here we go. So the difference between a CD quality PCM recording and an MP3 is the difference between this and this. Or this. Or this. So, there's really two questions. One is that's so subtle. Why are people freaking out about the sound quality question, which is an interesting cultural studies question that I can discuss in the Q&A. The other is, what does all this mean? And a common question that comes up around this work, and I've seen it asked by professional engineers, uh, by humanists, by social scientists, is why don't MP3s just go away? After all, now we have way more available storage and bandwidth than we did in the 1980s, right? Your phones are more powerful than your computers that you had in the 1980s. Why do we get more and more compressed, low definition, notice scare quotes, formats, instead of higher and higher definition audio formats? And the answer is that there's one more than one path through the history of media technologies. Footnote, 
low definition is a relative term, MP3s are way higher definition than cassettes or cylinders. And I should say definition is just a measure of data density, right? High definition PA, uh, TV has more pixels on it than standard definition TV. That's all it is. It's not a measure of reality or fidelity or anything else. So the way the history of media technologies is usually told, and those of you that do technical history will recognize this as a genre of wig history, is what I'm calling a general history very similar. And that story is one that technology marketers, like the consumer electronics industry, love to tell us, right? This new device is higher definition than the last device that we had to buy. This higher definition will give you a more realistic, faithful experience, even though definition and fidelity aren't the same thing, especially in sound. So if I didn't have a mic, and you and I were having a nice interpersonal conversation, and I turned around and walked away from you, the high end on my voice would go away, because high end is very directional. But if you see a movie, and two characters are having a dialogue, and that uh, character, one character walks away, the high end on that person's voice stays. That aesthetic is not real. It is, as Michel Chion says, paper real. So even though we think of definition in terms of fidelity. This is really a convenient engineering shorthand and not an accurate description of what uh, definition does even as a sort of representational or cultural phenomenon. And of course, the model subject here, right, the again, talking in terms of ideals, of this general history of verisimilitude is we need more and more realistic and intense experiences because um, you are going to be attentive, you're going to be engaged, you're going to be overwhelmed by the power of something like high definition TV or Blu-ray or super advanced video games or something like that. That's the rhetoric, that's how it works. But there's another path, and actually there are probably dozens of paths, um, but the path I became interested in through the MP3 is what I'm calling a general history of compression. It is a certain genre of engineering history of technology. So the first thing is um, that rather than going for higher and higher definition and higher fidelity, the concern is balancing efficiency and perception, right? Again, go back to the original question that drove the research into what we now call the MP3. It is we want real-time digital audio over these lines that won't be able to handle the size of a CD quality recording. Right, so there's a concern of balancing efficiency and perception. Definition is understood economically, as in definition is a limited resource. We only have so much room on our hard drives, and those of you with smartphones know that actually the most valuable part of your smartphone, the most expensive part of your smartphone, is the data plan. Right? Bandwidth is the most valuable, most precious resource in any communications infrastructure. And an interesting side effect of this is a sort of agnosticism about the subject of compressed media or compressed audio. It could be immersed and engaged and intensely interacting with uh, the content, but it could also be distracted, mobile, instrumental in its relationship, right? This is the difference between going to the movies and watching something on YouTube. Okay. So, this is a way of, in, of interrogating a progress-based or we uh, history of technology. And it points to two related issues. One is circulation and the other sound quality. But these are really long-term issues in the history of communication engineering. Which is to say, MP3s may be only 20 years old, but they orient us towards a much longer historical trajectory. The MP3 is in some ways a quintessential new communication technology with its pedestrian use of computing power that would have been unavailable to individuals a decade before. Its nonlinearity, its flexibility, it's careful tuning for limited bandwidth situations like computer networks, hard drives, and flash memory. 
But new is something of a misnomer, since digital technologies have been now around for over half a century. Right? In 1930, radio was not understood as a new medium, even though it was younger than, computer, than uh, computers are now. As much as the MP3 is a creature of the digital world, it is also a creature of the world of electronic and even electrical transmission. The ideas of hearing built into the MP3 go back decades to Bell Labs. The format has become historically legible when its standard is published in 1993, but it's part of much, much longer trajectories. And I'll give you two um, quick anecdotes from my research. So uh, the work was done both by reading a bunch of stuff and doing archival work, but since the inventors of the MP3 were all still alive, and since there's a lot of tacit knowledge assumed in the documents, I went around and interviewed people. And I asked Carl Heinz Brandenburg, who worked at Fraunhofer, well, where did that perceptual model Oh, and we're back. Where did that perceptual model come from? And um, Brandon Bird said, well, I literally took the tables of critical bands from uh, Hubert Hart Zwicker's textbook on psychoacoustics, and I coded them into the coder for my first draft of the coder. And it turned out it didn't quite work yet. By the time I'll get into why that is. I asked J.J. Johnston, who is the guy from at t Bell Labs, whose name is on some of the important MP3 patents. Johnston takes me down to his basement, pulls out a copy of Harvey Fletcher's Speech and Hearing, and says, this is where it all comes from. Now, Fletcher was an engineer at Bell Labs, working in the 19-teens and 20s. And Fletcher and his team developed something uh, that in the book I call perceptual techniques. So this device is an early audiometer. It is one of the precursors of the analog synthesizer. And the audiometer was designed to test hearing. So at first it made clicks, uh, later it made tones. And in fact, uh, um, if you want to read a lot more about the audiometer, I recommend uh, Mara Mills's article on the subject. But the audiometer is basically the device that allows um, psychoacousticians to test people, the frequency range of people's hearing. So it allows them to quantify the frequencies of the ear. So some of you have had a hearing test, right? Raise your hand if you hear this tone. Don't actually do that. <laughs> right, that's, that's how the hearing, the, the hearing test that you took is a descendant of this uh, technology. So what they did was basically they tried to determine the frequency range of normal hearing, not to produce higher definition phone systems, but rather to produce more efficient phone systems. Why was Bell Labs interested in hearing? Why was it interested in efficiency? Well, you'll recall by the 1920s in the US that um, Bell was um, becoming an officially sanctioned monopoly. They did not control their prices. And in capitalism, if you don't grow, you die. And that means that Bell had to find other ways to extract profit from their technology. Making their infrastructure carry more is one way to do that. So here's a quote from Harvey Fletcher's boss in the introduction to the 1929 edition of Speech and Hearing to give you an idea of how they thought about their work. I'm sure he thought it exactly like that. 
So this way of thinking about audio is very different from that general history of verisimilitude here. What they're trying to do is tune the phone system to the limits of the hearing of its users. They're trying to instrumentalize the limits of human hearing as a kind of propellant for the infrastructure. And the methods that they're using were very much in fashion at the time. So Friedrich Hitler uh, famously said that all media are psychotechnologies. And he was referring to psychotechnics, a term that was popularized in English by Hugo Munsterberg's Psychology and Industrial Efficiency in 1913. Psychotechnics was psychology applied to industry. Right? So the psychotechnician would try to figure out how workers on assembly lines might work more efficiently, or remember, this is the 19 teens and 20s, who is crazy enough to fly an airplane but not so insane as to crash it. So I'm talking about perceptual techniques, which is a, shall we say, more specific form of psychotechnics. And it represents a dual movement. On the one hand, perceptual techniques, this way of thinking both about perception and communication technology, meant that more and more communication technologies were designed around the measurement of human perception. And there's a whole story about those studies, which I won't talk today. But there's a flip side of this, which is the study of perception was more and more designed around the operational uh, routines and the industrial imperatives associated with communication technologies. So much so that I believe pretty much everything we think we know about hearing in the state of nature from work research in the 20th century is basically a result of the interaction between ears and media in one form or another. So perceptual techniques did for perception what ergonomics did for work. It tailored the medium to the person, which is, of course, a highly idealized measurement of a person, not a, a, an aggregate statistical represent, representation of personhood, not an actual single subject. Um, and also, it allowed for a transformation of the phone system. So, Theoretically, where Bell could fit one phone call into a line with the development of filtering after studying the just the minimal frequencies necessary for reproducing human speech, they said, actually, a lot of the frequencies we transmit on the phone lines, we don't need. In fact, we don't even need to fully transmit high-definition speech. So for instance, today, when you are, especially if you are Canadian, and making a credit card order over the phone, which I grant you is a less and less frequent occurrence in my life. Um, when it gets to the postal code, right, the difference between P and C, between F and S, is not actually audible over the phone line. And instead, you have to use language, Alpha Tango Foxtrot, F as in Frank, in order for the person to hear, because the phone expects listeners to fill in the gaps, right? So we're starting to see a connection between what's happening in Bell in the 20s and what's happening with MP3s in the 90s. So basically what Bell's doing is it's monetizing frequencies. In Marx's terms, you could say, they are developing a new form of relative surplus value where they could transmit a single phone call over a line through band limiting, through deploying, through actualizing the limits of their subjects, of their users, right? So this is the opposite of the free labor argument. Um, through people, uh, through operationalizing not doing, they were able to um, greatly increase the theoretical capacity of their infrastructures. Now, there are many more stories to tell. And in the book, um, I actually go through three cycles of the history. So there's the 30-year history of the people who invented 
the MP3. And um, that starts with research into digital audio coding in the 1970s. There's this 100-year history that I gave you a taste of today. And I didn't really have time to show how perceptual techniques actually leads to theories of information as they are developed um, after World War II. So the first two citations in Claude Shannon's uh, mathematical theory of communication are actually citations of work done at Bell Labs in the 1920s, for instance. Um, uh, but also uh, the informationalization of the human subject. So today, if you pick up a psychology of hearing textbook, Brian C.J. Moore, for instance, uh, the first thing it says is hearing is information processing. And that way of thinking is a direct descendant of this and also a very disturbing device that's a telephone made out of cats that I do not have time tell you about. And finally, there's this middle period in the history which uh, is really important where, so the principle of masking that I mentioned before uh, was known since the 19th century. Um, the development of the theory of critical bands, which is essentially a predictive theory of hearing, came in the 1940s and 1950s. And there were also changing attitudes towards computers as audio media and changing attitudes towards noise, which are really important parts of the story, uh, but I won't get to today. So um, how do we get from here to the MP3? Well, there's lots of intervening history, but I will say one thing. All that psychoacoustic research that Johnston and Carl Heinz Brandenburg coded into their first perceptual coders didn't work that well because the psychoacousticians built their theory of a hearing subject from tones and noise bursts. The engineers, meanwhile, were trying to reproduce speech and music, very different kinds of sound. And so what they did is they created a scenario for listening tests. Right? So yeah, this, this is a, basically a, a graphical representation of objectivity, where listeners would not know which audio they were hearing, and they take these A-B tests like I gave you just a few minutes ago, and try to determine the difference between coded and uncoded audio to see if the coding worked. And they use the scale, which actually comes from, um, well, hedonics comes from industrial psychology, and hedonic testing comes from, um, processed food after World War II. Um, so you could, uh, the measurements they were trying to do is the difference between perceptually coded audio and not coded audio. Is that difference imperceptible, perceptible but not annoying, slightly annoying, annoying, or very annoying? Which is a great scale. I recommend you use it on things in your everyday life <laughs> to test them. But it's a really interesting inversion of how we normally think of aesthetics, right? So instead of measuring pleasure, they're measuring revulsion, or rather it's very mellow engineering uh, uh, compatriot. Instead of uh, revulsion, they are measuring annoyance. All right, so there's many more stories to tell, and I'd like to tell them to you, but I'm out of time. So I want to thank you all. I look forward to your responses, and we can talk more in that. Our second speaker is uh, Professor Karen Besterfeld from the University of Maastricht. She's a professor of science, technology, and modern culture. Um, she did a PhD in 1996 on the history and academic and political discourse of aging. Um, she, I first encountered her work for a really interesting article that won the Usher Prize of our sister society, the Study History of Technology, um, which she co-authored with Viva Baker, Women Walking Through Plans, an article on gender and architecture. Um, she's been the academic director of the Netherlands Research School on Science, Technology and Modern Culture between 2005 and 2010. And she has several publications in the area of sound studies, probably most notably her book, Mechanical Sound, Technology, Culture, and Public Problems of Noise in the 20th Century. She has a very nice edited collection with Josie Van Dyke, Sound Souvenirs, Audio Technologies, Memory and Cultural Practices in 2010, 
Most recently, I've had the pleasure of co-editing with her the Oxford Sound Studies Handbook. Um, her talk is reaction to Jonathan's and a reading of Jonathan's book, and her title is Former Theory or Revolution, oh sorry, Re Revitalizing Science and Technology. So it needs a revolution. Thank you, Trevor, for uh, your kind introduction, and thank you, Jonathan, for a wonderful performance and with even some music in it. At least, I mean, reading a quote like this is actually music. Well, Trevor asked me to uh, comment on the book that is behind the presentation, and I would like to start with my very first thought after I had read it, and that was, why does this terrific book not position itself explicitly in SDS. Citations to SDS scholars pop up on nearly every other page. But Jonathan does not say this is an SDS book. And then I thought, why bother about that? I mean, Jonathan allows SDS to do exactly what it should do to inform a convincing analysis of a very important technology. But my answer is that it does matter to underline that this book is SDS. So I suddenly find myself in a position to underline that this label is important now. And I think it's important to prevent that the book is overlooked for what it is in my view, and that is an exemplary way of revitalizing SDS. And reversely, acknowledging the book's SDS character might also be a starting point for sharing how SDS could have been of even more help to uh, your uh, to Jonathan's arguments than is already the case. But let me first uh, unravel why the book wants to be something else than SDS. As the absence of the label seems no coincidence, and it may be, it, it may be uh, a surprise after hearing uh, the talk. Because in this introduction, Jonathan presents the study as a contribution to media studies, uh, media history and cultural studies. Uh, the book is about the notions of speaking, hearing, and communication built into the epic free format, and it's also a critical analysis of the significance of sound technologies uh, to the relations of contemporary digital media and culture. Now, these issues are indeed highly relevant and highly novel also to media and cultural studies. But the analysis itself is every inch SDS. And after having uh, explained that uh, MP3 is a shorthand for a standard that draws on perceptual coding and compression, you've just heard that, he chose, Johnson chose really with compressive commands, impressive commands, where we can find the conceptual and, and practical roots of MP3. So it's in the early 20th century telephonic. Uh, hearing research and the business strategies of Bell Labs for at and which already focus, as you have shown, on just intelligible speech for an efficient use of telephone lines. It's in information theory in the interval years, notably the obsession with minimizing signal distortion, and it's in psychoacoustic studies into masking effects. And these roots collectively contribute to the definition of hearing and also the re reduction of hearing to signal processing. Now, Jonathan himself defines his approach as formal theory. So while media analysis has a special interest in mediality, or the process of cross-referencing uh, between media, formal theory, and I quote Jonathan, would ask us to modulate the skill of our analysis of media somewhat differently. Studying formats highlights smaller purchases like software, operating standards, codes, as well as larger registers like infrastructure, international, corporate consortia, and whole tech system. systems. And it invites us to ask after the changing formations of media, the context of their receptions, the conjunctions that shape the essential characteristics, and the institutional politics in which they were enmeshed. Now, how does this sound? As Astians, indeed. And in addition to the history of science, business, and engineering already mentioned, uh, Jonathan uses Astian's work on standardization and testing to explain how a particular aesthetic was interwoven in the MPEG layer 3, and also to show how industrial interests and path dependency 
uh, ensured that MP3s and not MP2s are everywhere. And just in case I sound a bit compressed, I should flag that Jonathan does this storytelling or his storytelling with uh, the lucidity, which precision in technical detail and analytical strength we already know from his earlier work. But still, why does Jonathan not present himself in the book as an associate of SDS? Now, initially I assumed that it was just an issue of form and background. SDS seems to serve as the springboard board from which to challenge received wisdom in media and cultural studies. An example of such perceived wisdom is the idea that empathy technology has liberated users from the commercial confines of the music industry by contributing to the free distribution of music and enabling mashups yeah, with ha without having to bow to the music industry's mass-oriented taste. And Jonathan critically comments on this by pointing on the empathy's dependency on the telephone industry, its notions of listening, and to the fact that the music in industry has greatly profited from piracy practices through selling blank musical carriers and music players, and he uses the history of piracy, also SCS work on the history of this kind of piracy practices to show this. So Johnson, Johnson's audience is a uh, media and cultural studies public, and SCS is an important way to educate them. Fine. And this may even be wise with an eye on marketing the MP3 Because we, as we are together, may think that SDS is quite a field, that we are quite a crowd. But if you imagine all the media studies people together and the cultural studies, that's even a bigger crowd. But then my eye fell on a footnote. Footnotes are usually boring, but if you read Johnson's books, the footnotes are just as interesting as, as the rest of the text. And this is footnote 26 of the book's first body chapter. And Jonathan there claims that his focus on AT&T, a successful industry, is unfashionable in business history because many authors follow a social constructivist approach that makes them turn away from the perspective of the winners and from realist categories of political economy. And despite its strengths, he says, social constructivism is not as powerful a methodology for addressing systematic political questions, which are at the heart of my inquiry here. Ah, I thought, now I found it. Uh, even though not all of SDS is social constructivist, and even someone from Maastricht knows that, uh, its dominance in SDS may have made Jonathan cautious in associating himself all too easily with the field. My point, however, is that the book never becomes more political or more realist than social constructivists normally do. Even though it does not officially abide to the first rule of symmetry, so the idea that a fruitful analysis of science and technology dynamics should treat winning and losing technologies and scientific ideas symmetrically, he continuously underwrites its consequence that the outcome of the development could have been different. That is evident from, uh, for instance, the contingencies he describes when analyzing standardization, but it's crucial on the last page of his book. And there he says, if it is true that the MP3 is structured by scientific knowledge of hearing and the dominant forces of the sound culture from which it emerged, it is also true that all prior scientific knowledge of hearing is touched by the cultural field in which ears and sound technologies interact. And that implies to Jonathan that to overcome the reduction of listening to information processing in the future, we should go for a plurality of contexts of research. But is this remark more political than most social constructivists would dare to be? I doubt it, although I must say that most people in the hall are much better equipped to take up this issue with Jonathan than I do. But a similar question mark is relevant for Jonathan's claim that hearing research needs to develop better models for how to account for differences in, for instance, culture and language. In fact, social constructive and SDS offers a plethora of democratic models of science that aim to incorporate that mainstream voices. But Jonathan does not walk down that path. In my 
view, Johnson does not so much inspire SDS by being more political, but by three other contributions, three really very important contributions. First, he does not focus on empty free uses and use of practices, but on business strategies and the production of empty free, something which David Edgerton uh, would applaud, who uh, deplores that studying production has went out of fashion in SDS. He even uses the word shockingly demon day. So, demo day is the expression. So, uh, we, we, we focus too much on the users instead of the production. And the way Jonathan does it is at times reminiscent of Thomas Hughes' work on large technological systems. And an example is Jonathan's eye for the innovating effects of AT&T's aim to transmit more calls per moment across telephone lines. Something LCS would identify as being close, although it's certainly not the same, as being close to enhancing the load factor of a system. Even if it's not new, it's refreshing and revitalizing to see such approaches return in the discussion on the technology that is usually discussed from a user perspective. Well, second, Jonathan constantly invokes his conceptual strength to unravel technologies in context. He writes history with a philosopher's voice, in then identifying structural similarities in the technologies and technology making across time. And even there has to be explicitly anachronistic. And his insightful notion of perceptual techniques, we've just heard it, so the application of perceptual research for the purpose of economizing signals. And Mara will tell more about that later. She will also say something about this perceptual techniques. This notion allows him to show that perceptual coding in AT&T's telephone research and thus its affinities with the MP3 technology um, uh, is important, even though perceptual coding was not known as such in uh, the early 20th century. Now, I'm an historian, and historians are not supposed to like anachronism, but I loved this kind of anachronism. It's recent anachronism, because it helps to overcome uh, uh, problems so often identified in STS, that case studies, state case studies, without creating bigger pictures. And I really like this, this eye for the stru structural affinities. You know, you do it because you are so strong in, in, in you do a sort of conceptual analysis of technology. And that's, I think, uh, really new to, to SES. It's not completely new, but it, it, it is, for me, very refreshing to, to, to uh, read about this at this particular moment in time. And then third, through this focus on perceptual techniques, Techniques, Jonathan does something that is again not very common in SDS today, but not as important, and that's clarifying and providing a di diagnosis of the content of a major long term trend in science and technology. In, science, in SDS, we are good in, in creating the bigger pictures uh, and the theory, theories by focusing on the mechanisms of science and technology development beyond particular cases. And if we focus on content, we tend to follow the fashion of the scientists. So it's nanotech technology, it's genomics, it's uh, supercomputers. Um, but Jonathan points at the logics of perceptual techniques in past and present and expects it it's to stay important um, in innovation for some time. Now, drawing the circle a bit wider, this study flags the wide use and simulation of the senses in new products and instruments of research today. For instance, instruments that uh, smell cancer, this is one of these new technologies that it makes, makes use of perception. It's not uh, perceptual coding or perceptual techniques, but it again is close. Now, doing SDS in such a way, I think, contributes to its relevance because it offers society a means of understanding itself. In sum, this is a very extensive way of saying that Trevor made an excellent choice in inviting Jonathan to do this opening speech today. I think you're the right person at the right time, at the right place. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, our third and final speaker is um, Mara Mills, who's Assistant Professor of Media, Culture and Communication 
at NYU. Um, Mara did her PhD in the History of Science at Harvard University. Uh, she works at the intersection of disability studies and media studies. Um, her research and teaching interests include communication history, science and technology studies, disability theory, and mobile media studies. Uh, she's completing a book at the moment. I've got this on her webpage. She's not smiling. Uh, she's completing a book at the moment on the phone, deafness, and communication engineering. Um, her, her publications have won a number of prizes. Let me just mention a couple. Uh, in just last year, she won the Morris Donors Article Prize in International Committee for the History of Technology for an article on disability and cybernetics. Uh, just this year, she won the Walter Benjamin Award for Outstanding Article in Media Ecology for an article called Hearing Aids and the History of Electronics Miniaturization. And Mara's doing something, I just have to point this out. Uh, many of us lament the fact that this 4S meeting is kind of at the same time as the shop meeting, because some of us would like to go to both. And the shop meeting is actually, I think, starting tomorrow. But Mara is managing to talk at both meetings. She's taking a red eye tonight at 10 o'clock to get to where a shop is taking place. Portland, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, the title of her talk today is What Does Sound Studies Teach Us About Techniques? Transduction, oscillators, 
negative feedback, numerous other functions have migrated into biology from electroacoustics. Despite notable scholarship on the rhetoric and impact of information theory and cybernetics, there has been surprisingly little STS work on communication technologies, or ICT. This was the subject of Judy Weissman's presidential plenary in Tokyo three years ago. I see Jonathan Stern's new book as a rejoinder, one that is certain to shift the field. How is an epistemology and set of tools derived from sound wave control come to reconfigure media technology and even the elements and capacities of life? What follows is a very abridged timeline, which will touch down a few times on Stern's work. The Oxford English Dictionary dates the phrase communication engineering to the 1920s, the decade when MIT and other universities began to offer courses in the field. However, the concept can be traced to international debates in the telephone industry at the outset of the century about the increasing convergence of wired voice, telegraph, and wireless technology. Already in 1907, the editor of the American Telephone Journal argued that the term telephone engineer was too limited, given the exchange of components and techniques between telephony and telegraphy. We need a phrase, he wrote, which will be at once broader and more descriptive. Someone has suggested communication engineer, but it may be that this is hardly descriptive enough, and some will object to the sound of that title. Four years later, the editor of Cyclopedia of Telephony and Telegraphy tentatively adopted the term. He wrote, the communication engineer, if he may be so called, requires a knowledge both, both of the mechanism of his instruments and of the vagaries of the current that makes them talk. In addition to hardware and signals, this author suggested that communication engineering encompassed infrastructure, poles, wires, and buildings, and also routines, time-saving methods, and office systems. By 1948, in the article Time, Communication, and the Nervous System, Norbert Wiener would extend communication engineering almost to the point of universality. The theory of the telephone is, of course, communication engineering, he explained. But the theory of the computing machine belongs equally to that domain. According to Wiener, humans, other animals, even societies could be understood as communication instruments. The unifying idea of these diverse disciplines, he argued, is the message. Communication engineering is the art of introducing specific transformations into messages and transmitting them from point to point. These transformations included amplification, filtering, synthesizing, although in this article, Wiener, like Stern, was particularly interested in message compression, what he called, quote, reducing design to a principle of minimization. In his 1949 review of the book Cybernetics, Alan Turing extended these concepts to molecular biology, arguing the new subject of information theory arose at first from the communication engineering of the telegraph, telephone, and radio, but it has connections with many subjects. Communication in the nervous system and by hormones, bring in physiology and biochemistry. The transmission of hereditary characteristics um, by genes brings in genetics and evolution. Communication engineering had by then, by the mid-century, come to focus on the signal and the arts of transmission. The electrical signal was earlier theorized in telegraphy and neurophysiology, as Laura Otis and Tim Lenore have demonstrated. However, telephone engineers worked with complex waveforms and emphasized their manipulation as the essence of communication. Internal AT&T histories mark 1925 as another turning point from a corporate interest in, quote, the conquest of distance to the reduction of costs. Before 1925, the telephone field was occupied with amplification to prevent signal loss over long distances. But around 1915, the combination of the vacuum tube and the wave filter had allowed carrier systems to be planned, whereby signals were superimposed on electrical waves of other frequencies through modifications in amplitude, AM, frequency, FM, and later phase. In the telephone and wireless fields, this technique was described as modulation, a term taken up from music and then widely disseminated. Between 1918 and the 1950s, a number of telephone carrier systems were installed between various US cities 
to enable multiplexing, sending many signals simultaneously over the same line through the use of separate frequency channels. Um, Axel Volmar, who I know is here somewhere, um, is one of the few people who's written on this topic in his wonderful edited volume, um, which is, I think, only in German still, a Time Critical Media. During World War II, other AT&T engineers built a sound spectrograph for visualizing speech waves to determine which components were essential. This device, which Frederick Nebiger describes as, quote, one of the first examples of signal processing hardware, automated time frequency analysis, which is now a central technique in the field. It's a variation of Fourier analysis. Similarly, the wave filter, the vacuum tube, and other components moved from audio into widespread engineering domains. The efficiency paradigm also brought human factors engineering, also known as ergonomics, to bear on communication. AT&T had one of the first industrial human factors labs, and in 1918, the firm launched a study of human facial anatomy in an effort to design a handset that was at once comfortable and intuitive, and which moreover would force users to hold the transmitter right next to their lips. This in turn would increase the loudness of the signal, the loudness of the voice signal, and hence the efficiency of transmission. The result was a handset based on the average of 4,000 head measurements, estimated to be usable by all but 3% of the adult population. The human factors approach was next extended to the speech wave itself, again in this paradigm of making the signal efficient, in a series of talker volume studies which led to a redesigned transmitter with improved fidelity. In, in the 1920s, the telephone receiver was optimized through a series of listening tests and audiometric measurements. As Stern demonstrates, these studies contributed by the end of the century to the technique of perceptual coding, whereby a signal is compressed through the elimination of irrelevant material, in the case of the MP3, masked sounds that the ear doesn't hear. Stern's notion of perceptual techniques, I think, is a crucial extension of Mumford's thesis that media, quote, duplicate and further organic operations, a, a thesis that's been rehashed or rewarmed by a number of other media theorists since then. Electronic media don't just reproduce and extend perception. They also manipulate and streamline it. Natasha Schul's Addiction by Design offers a similar kind of analysis, and I think we'll see more in the near future. To complete the line from telephony to signal processing at large, with computer automation in the 1950s and 60s, the manipulation of signals became increasingly complex and was increasingly described as processing rather than modulation. The verb form of the word process, meaning to operate on mechanically according to a set procedure, came into use in the late 19th century in the arena of food processing. The term signal processing was at first mostly applied to digital coding, such as pulse code modulation, or PCM, and vocoder-based compression. PCM, invented in the 1920s by telephone employees in the US and France, was commercialized in the T1 carrier system, launched by AT&T in 1962, the first digital transmission system, excluding telegraphy, um, and I doubt there's a lot of uh, diehard um, tele telegraphy fans here, but in case there are, at shot I would probably get attacked by the people who think telegraphy is the start of everything, but in telegraphy the coding of the message is done by hand, it's not automated. PCM also moved from telephony into other audio and video applications. Part of the reason I'm trying to hit all of these points about telephony is that often, if you're in the field of sound studies, people think you're a, like a guy in a band. Like there's a tendency to not take the field seriously. So, and, so yes, I'm making a big claim at the beginning of this talk, but I'm also walking you through this timeline, which depending on how much you like the history of signal processing is more or less exciting or dry to show how many of these things came out of speech wave and sound wave control. Um, with PCM, encoding began to be used as a synonym for both modulation and processing. Nebiger, who has written a brief but indispensable history of this topic, explains today that signal processing refers broadly, quote, to any changes made to signals so as to improve their transmission or use. This includes filtering, coding, estimating, detecting, analyzing, recognizing, synthesizing, recording, and reproducing. Compression is one outcome of signal processing, and Stern's critique of the ways fidelity has been overplayed in media studies 
is a brilliant intervention of the MP3 book. However, I would caution against letting compression become a substitute master narrative. And actually, Jonathan, you've really downplayed your, tonight your argument about compression. I've heard you make, turn your sort of general history of compression into a more of a like, there's no more fidelity, it's all compression. So my, what I'm gonna say now is maybe, maybe you've, you've changed your thoughts on compression, we'll have to talk about this. Um, the telecommunications industry always balanced cost with speed, reliability, and quality. Among the many types of signal processing are some that favor redundancy um, for error correction or robustness, others involve synthesis. All of these involve value judgments about what should be transmitted and how it should be received. Uh, compression itself is often lossless. Elements extracted during transmission are completely right, reconstituted at the receiver. And techniques for signal compression were developed as part of a broad cost-saving program in telecommunications that included things like multiplexing, which at first increased the bandwidth of each speech channel while maximizing the total space on an expensive copper line. At the same time, compression has sometimes been applied to combat distortion rather than cut costs. Um, I also have doubts about the domestication of noise as a wholesale paradigm shift. And you didn't talk about this in your talk today, but those of you who are familiar with Jonathan's book, he makes another huge claim. There's a, it's, there's a cliche of sound studies um, to talk, about no, to talk about noise as something unwanted. Um, Jonathan makes an argument that with the MP3, there's a shift to turning to optimizing noise or, and making noise productive. I'll, I'll, I'll summarize that. Um, I would describe the exploitation of some kinds of noise to mask others, a new technique and a paradigm still defined by noise reduction. So in the case of the MP3, which you can read about it because you didn't hear about it tonight, the artifacts of signal processing are themselves turned noise, unwanted disturbances to the music signal, and they're strategically buried beneath other sounds where the listener will not detect them. But in other cases, and in, even in other moments in the life cycle of the MP3, error correcting codes, filters, wires, cables, and displays continue to be designed to systematically eliminate or at least reduce environmental and electronic noise. My own interest in this topic was prompted by an investigation of deafening, um, which became a vastly salient concept in English in the early 20th century. The word was coined at that time. It was fueled by a broad cultural discourse on noise, as well as activism by hard of hearing people who wanted to distinguish themselves from those born deaf, and they hence called themselves deafened. Engineers and activists alike became concerned with hearing loss, which might be situational, occurring as a result of noise on radio sets and telephone lines, or actual, caused by ear-splitting factories, battlegrounds, and urban centers. In turn, in the US, the development of the electronic audiometer and the audiogram, the normal curve for hearing, emerged out of a collaboration between the telephone company and the New York League for the Heart of Hearing. These tools became essential for delineating human factors for future audio engineering and for determining who would be a user and who would be excluded. And this brings me to my final point. Attention to hearing and communication difference is, increased, is an increasingly regular feature of sound studies. And this, to my mind, is the most significant of Stern's contributions to the field. In 2003, in the audible past, he observed that sound studies had failed to incorporate the insights of deaf and disability theory. He wrote, scholars of speech, hearing, and sound seem largely ignorant of the scholarly or the cultural work on deafness. This statement turned out to be prescriptive rather than diagnostic. The field of sound studies had just been launched, and a number of subsequent authors have since then responded to his challenge. Honestly, I can't think of another branch of media studies that has had so much work on disability studies happen from the outset. Um, and and I, that's, this is due to, your, to the audible past. Um, it has become clear that deafness is often a variety of hearing and that sound is always multimodal. Sound waves transfer between media, air, water, electricity, and can be experienced by sensory domains beyond the ear. Vibrations, visual recordings, and speech gestures are all possible components of an acoustic event. The desire of heterogeneous listeners to capture, translate, and amplify sound, coupled with the transience of the sound wave itself, 
underlies the history of techniques 